Hello! Today we're going to talk about the photoelectric effect. And our single goal today is just to understand the basics of this experiment. So before we get there, we're going to talk about the electron volt, which is a unit of energy. And it's kind of handy when you're uh, dealing with electrons. So the electron volt happens to be the amount of energy associated with the accelerating electron and electron through a potential difference of one volt. So you take an electron, you release it from rest, put it between two parallel plates with a uh, potential difference of a volt across the plates, and the electron accelerates across the gap, and when it gets to the far side, it's got a, an energy of one electron volt. And one electron volt happens to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus, minus 19 joules. And of course you've seen a number like this before with different units. The charge on the electron in coulombs is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And of course that's not a coincidence. Okay, so you take the charge multiplied by the voltage and you've got energy units. And in joules it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 and in electron volts it's simply 1. Okay, so it's a very convenient unit, the electron volt, when you're dealing with individual electrons. The other thing to remember is we can use our familiar wave equation. Usually we write it as V is F lambda. Here we're writing it as C is F lambda, where C represents the speed of light in vacuum. And also we've got an equation that says the energy of a photon is H Planck's constant multiplied by the uh, frequency. And you can combine these to get um, frequency and energy for photons. Okay, so let's consider the visible spectrum. Okay, the visible spectrum we know runs from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. 400, of course, is at the violet end of the spectrum. 700 nanometers is up at the far red end of the of the visible spectrum. Okay, so if you take this wavelength, 400 nanometers for violet light, you figure out what the equivalent frequency is. Or you could also write the energy equation as, uh, well, F is C over lambda. So you could write it as E is H C over lambda, if you'd like. And H, again, is Planck's constant, which, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. OK, so you convert that uh, wavelength to frequency, or you just rewrite the energy equation in terms of wavelength and you can figure out what the energy is. And the energy of a 400 nanometer photon with a frequency, the corresponding frequency is 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz, so these are really very high frequency uh, things here. The energy is 3.1 electron volts. Do the same thing for 700 nanometer right, uh, red light. You get corresponding frequency, 4.3 times 10 to the 14 hertz, and an energy of 1.8 electron volts. Okay. But the bottom line here is we're talking about somewhere between approximately 2 and 3 electron volts. And so your eye, for instance, the receptors in your eye, are sensitive to photons that have energies in between this range, 1.8 to 3.1 electron volts. You go below that or even above that, and your uh, detectors in your eye are just not sensitive to that. Okay, but a couple of electron volts is what we're talking about energy-wise for visible for photons in the visible spectrum. Okay, so let's talk about the photoelectric effect. And there's some history here because Einstein won in 1921. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. And it wasn't for his work on relativity, but in fact it was for explaining the photoelectric effect. And what is the photoelectric effect? Well, it occurs when you shine light on a metal surface. And this may cause electrons to be emitted. And that's what this picture at the bottom is showing. So these squiggly lines coming in are, uh, is, represents light coming in. And then a couple of electrons are being knocked out. And by the way, this is very closely related to how solar panels generate electric electricity. So photovoltaic panel 
works on a very similar principle here. Okay, so here again is um, three pictures here. They're slightly different. Uh, if you look at picture B, it's got a battery that picture A does not have. And picture C has the same battery, but the battery's uh, orientation is, is reversed. Okay, so what are we trying to show here? Well, here's how you could actually set up a photoelectric effect experiment. Okay, so you shine light down on this plate one, and those little round objects above the plate are supposed to be electrons that have been knocked off the plate by the, uh, by the incident light. And those can run across the gap and run into plate two, and then they'd run back around through the wires and through the ammeter back to plate one. And of course, you, you would measure a current on the ammeter. So what you'd like to know is what energy do these electrons have? And by putting a battery into the circuit, you can actually, uh, you can actually tell what the energy is. So if we hooked it up as in picture B, then what happens there is the top plate ends up positive and you're not getting electrons off here. So the electrons would be attracted to that positive plate and so you draw them over to plate two. Okay. Well, it turns out as far as measuring the energy that those electrons goes, that's not actually very helpful. So in fact, we really set it up as in picture three where the positive terminal of the battery is, is down. So plate one ends up positive, plate two ends up negative. And so what happens there is the light comes in, uh, possibly knocks some electrons out, and the electrons leave the plate with a certain amount of kinetic energy. But then there's actually a field that goes uh, up from plate one to plate two in picture C, electric field we're talking about. And so there's a force on the electrons which is now down. Okay? And so what you can do is you can actually reduce the current in this through the ammeter to zero. Okay. If you get no battery, then you get some electrons running over to plate two, and you get some current. As you gradually increase the voltage on this battery in plate in uh, picture C, you can slowly in decrease the current because fewer and fewer electrons make it over to plate two. And then you find if you turn it up just enough, you can actually reduce the current to zero. So then you know the voltage that is uh, the potential difference across the gap. And you can convert that to an energy. And so you can say, well, the kinetic energy, the maximum kinetic energy the electron said when they left plate one uh, must now be the potential energy they have as they come up and just barely miss reaching plate two. And so you've got a direct measurement of that kinetic energy from that uh, battery voltage, the voltage that's just large enough to cause the current to drop to zero. Okay. Okay. So we have two competing models of this um, this experiment. How how it might work. Okay. So if we believe that uh, light acts as a wave, and remember we have just tons of evidence that light does act as a wave. You know, we've got diffraction, we've got interference, we've got all sorts of things like that. We've got the uh, Thin film interference, you know, you can only explain these experiments in terms of light acting as a wave. Okay, so can you apply the wave theory to the photoelectric effect? So the basic idea in that case would be electromagnetic waves interact with electrons in the metal. These waves transfer energy to the electrons, and once those electrons get enough energy, they pop out of the, uh, the surface, pop off the surface. The particle model is a little bit different in terms of its predictions. Okay, so now we're treating light as if it's made up of uh, sort of packets of energy we call photons. And then instead of looking kind of at a holistic approach where you get waves interacting with the electrons, you look at individual photons interacting with individual electrons. This is what the particle theory is all about. Okay, so there's because these are different models, they make different predictions about what's going to happen when light shines down on a metal. Okay, so let's just go over these various predictions in turn. Okay. 
So, prediction number one. Light of any frequency will cause electrons to be emitted. Well, that's actually what the wave model says, and the particle model does not say that, disagrees with that. Okay, so what happens here is that the electrons are basically bound to the metal. You have to put some amount of energy in, some minimum amount of energy in, to extract an electron. And that's what's called the work function. Work function for a particular metal, every type of metal has its own value. That's the minimum energy needed to extract an electron from the metal. Okay, so with the wave model, the idea is that, well, you shine light on the metal long enough, and the metal absorbs enough energy, and eventually you reach enough energy to knock out an electron. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what um, frequency you have. You've got enough energy after a while to knock out an electron. Particle model makes a different prediction. So the photon energy is proportional to frequency, E equals HF. Okay, and we've got, if we have individual photons interacting with individual electrons, then the photon energy needs to be at least equal to the work function to have any chance of knocking out an electron. Okay, if your work function is like four electron volts, and you shine visible light on that thing, where the maximum energy in the visible light is 3.1 electron volts, you're not going to see any electrons coming off. That's the prediction of the particle model. Okay, so that's sort of kind of consistent with this. If the frequency is below a certain value, that means the energy is below a certain value. Then no electrons will be emitted. The wave model disagrees with that. The particle model agrees with that particular prediction. Okay, so there's these two pairs of predictions which are opposite for the wave and particle model. Okay, then we get a second set. How about this? Increasing the intensity of the light increases the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. Once again, the wave model says yes to that, and the particle model says no. So what does increasing intensity mean? Well, it means increasing the energy that's incident on the metal. And that means more energy is available to the electrons. The electrons, you would think, would come off with higher kinetic energy. The particle model, again, you're talking about individual photons interacting with individual electrons. So by increasing the intensity, we're assuming we don't change the frequency of the light, we're actually sending more photons at the metal. Okay, but the photon energy is unchanged. So each, each individual photon does not have any more energy than it had before. You just got more photons coming in. So the prediction there, in fact, is that more electrons will come out, but these electrons don't have any more energy than they had before. Okay, so then we have this opposite kind of prediction. Increasing the intensity of the light increases the number of electrons emitted, but not their maximum kinetic energy. So that is exactly what the particle model predicts, but the wave model disagrees with that. Okay, so we get these different models and different predictions. Okay, and then so we run the experiment, and once again we've had just tons of history of experiments that could only be explained in terms of light acting as a wave, and this is what really happens when we run this particular experiment, the photoelectric effect, shine light down on a metal, see what happens. All the predictions of the wave model turn out not to be true, and all the predictions of the particle model turn out to be true. In other words, you can only explain this experiment in terms of light acting as photons. Not waves, but photons. And this is what Einstein did. This was Einstein's explanation. So he was the first one who really had the idea that light existed in little packets we call, packets of energy we call photons. And it, he turned out to be correct. And uh, that's what they gave him the Nobel Prize for. And again, it's got lots of great applications, including uh, solar cells. Okay, so let's go over the details of this experiment a little bit more. And so we can apply energy conservation here. So we've got photon coming in. It's got some energy, HF. And we shine it on the metal, and the metal take some energy, the work amount equal to the work function at least, and you may or may not have some energy left over, and if you do, then 
the electron takes that away in the form of kinetic energy. Okay, so here's a nice energy balance equation that represents all that. HF, <coughs> pardon me, HF is the energy of the incident photon. W0 is the, uh, uh, what we use to write the work function of the metal. That's a positive quantity. And then W0 represents the least amount of energy you have to put in to knock off an electron. So if you divert the least amount over to that, then you get the most left over for kinetic energy. So that's what we call K max, the maximum kinetic energy electrons have when they leave. And again, Planck's constant is this value, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And the work function depends on the metal. So aluminum has a particular value, copper has a particular value, zinc has a particular value, etc., etc. OK, so now we have these lovely graphs. Let's go I'm trying to go over this graph. This is a typical graph that results in a uh, photoelectric effect experiment. And so we graph K max as a function of uh, photon frequency. And you see if the photon frequency is less than F0, F0 is what we call the threshold frequency, well, HF0 is an energy that's equal to the work function. So if you've got an energy less than that, which means F is less than F0, then you don't have enough energy to knock electrons out. So no electrons come out. Okay, so K max equals zero, that means no electrons are coming out. Then you get up to the threshold frequency, right at the threshold frequency, an electron comes out, but it's got no kinetic energy. And then if you slowly increase the frequency, then you get more and more photon energy, and you get more and more kinetic energy for the electrons. And you get a nice linear relationship here, where if you graphed maximum kinetic energy of the electrons versus frequency of the incident photons, the slope happens to be Planck's constant. So this experiment, in fact, is a great way to measure Planck's constant. And if you extend that line back, you see that it hits the, uh, the vertical axis at a value of minus W0, so you can also measure uh, work functions. And if you figure out what F0 is, you can also get the work function from that, because HF0 is, the, is equal to the work function. OK. And so our photoelectric effect exper uh, equation is HF is W0 plus K max. So here we're rearranging it to K max is HF minus W0. So this is in the form Y, K max, equals MX. X is F in this case, M the slope is H, Planck's constant, uh, plus B, that would be minus W0, that's our Y intercept. Okay, so you can draw these nice graphs, and it's also neat to see, um, to draw graphs of K max in electron volts as a function of photon energy, not photon frequency, but photon energy, uh, HF, and you get some nice lines there and you can pick off the work function. It's actually a little bit easier to find the work function and you should figure out what the slope is on that graph as well. Okay, I think that might be all I have for today about the photoelectric effect.